This video is brought to you by Manscaped.com, the premium brand for men's grooming and hygiene products. Manscaped just launched their fourth generation trimmer, the new Lawnmower 4.0. The Lawnmower 4.0 trimmer has advanced ceramic blades with skin safe technology. This helps reduce any nicks and cuts and can be easily replaced with a fresh blade so you can groom with confidence. It's cordless and waterproof so you can trim in the shower. That's super convenient and makes for easy cleanup too. Get 20% off and free international shipping with Manscaped using the promo code MACHINE at manscaped.com. That's promo code M-A-C-H-I-N-E at the cart and get 20% off and free shipping. If you're looking to go smoother, you're in luck. With feedback from millions across the globe, Manscaped has designed the perfect groin grooming solution for men. That's manscaped.com. Use the code MACHINE. Hey everyone, welcome to Mean Machine Talks. I'm Dean and today I have a fantastic guest, a game that I love and if you've been on my Twitch streams, you'll love too. It is Fran from the game Unmetal. I am so excited to talk to you today. So, so, so excited. Thank you so much for you giving me your time today. Um, I can't express how happy I am to talk to you. You've made an incredible game that I love and I've gone back playing it multiple times and the feedback from what I hear from people who I have gifted the game to or the reviews it, you've just made magic um and I'm so happy that you've managed to create this incredible game and I get to talk to you today so how are you today I hope things are well in your side of the world well I'm very well especially now after you did this incredible description, I feel very flattered. It's very flattering. Uh, yeah. So, yes, you, you just made my day. I'm, Good. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's easy. Podcast done. End. No, no, we're not doing that. We've got we've got plenty to talk about today. So, um, so again, yeah, thank you very much. Um, so, what I normally do with my guests to start with is I essentially offer you the floor. So, if you've got any social media accounts you wish to promote or any upcoming projects or where we can buy our metal, go for it. The floor is yours. Oh, my God, the floor is mine. <laughs> yeah, uh, concerning our metal... My social media, I guess, use uh, Twitter. It's something short. It's, it's very, very, very easy to use. I tried using uh, Facebook. It's completely discarded. I tried using uh, the one from the Pix photograph. What's it called Instagram? Uh, Instagram, yes. Total mess. I have no idea how to use it. I tried several times. I really tried, but no way. So my my main social media is uh, Twitter. If you want to follow me, it's an epic underscore friend. And it's there where I, where I publish anything, any news about the metal or all the productions, anything I do, professional or video games. That's that's the way. And metal, it can be purchased uh, basically everywhere. It can be purchased in uh, on Steam, on GOG, or on uh, Epic Store. You, in consoles, you will find it in the Switch, PS4, PS5, and Xbox. And you have an M6 version called Prisoner of War hmm. that you can find as well in in an M6 uh, <laughs> shop. In fact, the uh, Prisoner of War. Can, can be four and metal and metal is some sort of upgrade a porting of this first MSX game I did based on mm. of course the first MSX Metal Gear. Oh, okay. Well I didn't I didn't know it was an MSX version. So I've actually purchased my yeah. very first MSX. It's actually a uh, uh, an Arabic MSX. It's an MXX one. Um, and it's a, it's a very strange computer that isn't it? It's like like for me, especially in the West, um, in the UK, we had a lot of you know micro computers and stuff. And when you look at the MSX and you compare this with you know the Sinclair Spectrum, the mm -hmm. Commodore sixty four, and you look at the two and you're going, this doesn't look like <laughs> it looks like a computer from the future. So it looks completely different from anything else. But yeah, the MSX is a very a very unique computing system. Um, someone once asked me to describe it, and I said it was like getting a NES Nintendo Entertainment System and a Commodore 64 and slamming the two together, and you end up with this computer console hybrid 
thing that exists. But um, yeah, I, I, I still have a lot to learn about the MSX. It was one computer that I know very little about. Um, but that's that's a great story, and I guess that's a great place to start, actually. So, yeah, in fact, in fact, Konami, it was it is thanks to MSX. They yeah. started uh, creating video games for MSX, and they became famous thanks to this platform. Sure. Yeah, so I mean, Metal Gear um, and Metal Gear Two. I actually streamed it um, two weeks ago, I think, on my Twitch, and it was really impressive to see how this in modern day times uh, old technology um, can produce such amazing things, um, and it, it, you have to cast your mind back to the old tech, the game that's being created, and, and how impressive the game that quality that came out is is really quite something special so let's talk about unepic because i didn't know that the msx version came before the current version so let's talk a little bit about that so let, let's talk about the msx version how did that start how did you get the idea for this well the thing is uh i just uh, after a kick a kickstart project that didn't didn't work i asked my uh my followers, hey guys, what would you like me to do next for MSX? And I gave them four options. First one was uh, Metal Gear for MSX 1. The second one was uh, Mesa of Gallius 2. The third one was some sort of um, Nemesis, uh, Nemesis game, also known as Gradius. Mm -hmm. The fourth, I can't remember. <laughs> but uh, the Metal Gear was the winner by far, so no contest. So half of, of everyone just wants the uh, Excuse me, I'm a Metal Gear for MSX1. So I did it. And when the game was finished and it came out, it was a big success. So everyone loved it. And the story just ended there. So that, that, that was the end of the story. And I said, okay, now it's, it's time to create a video game, a big video game for PC and consoles just to earn money. Because with MSX, you don't get money at all. It's just, you know, by passion, because you like it, you love the... The, the platform you you have when when you were when you were a kid. So I tried two three different things, different ideas, and after a couple of months, I said I'm not fully convinced. I don't I don't know. There was something, you know, you think an idea, and then when you start doing it, you say mm, it's not as funny as I thought. So I said, what could I do? Okay, let's try. Let's make a port, a port of uh, of this prisoner of war to PC, just to you know to. Uh, to clear the brain. Hmm. Yes, uh, let's leave apart ideas and just let's, let's have a break. And then I started to like it and said, oh, that's cool. I'm starting to enjoy it, just working on it. And the final result was co coming better and better and better. In the end, what was going to be some sort of break, it became the big project itself. So after a year and a half, the project was finished. And then I released it for PS Vita. Because the thing is, uh, at the end of uh, 2021, um, a publisher told me, hey, Frank, you know that Vita is going to stop releasing new video games. <laughs> so if you, don't, if you don't have your game ready before the end of 2021, just forget about it. And I said, no, I want, I want the game released in Vita because hmm. the, the community of PS Vita is, is very similar to MSX. 6 They have a big passion for, a, pa passion, a big passion for, the, for the console. And so I just, I left everything. I had two months and I said, okay, let's go for it. I start to work hard on the porting and I managed to do it. So uh, I think it was March uh, 2021. No, it was at the end of 2020, not 2021. I'm just getting confused. <laughs> but the thing is, in March 2021, the game just came out and everyone just bought the, the physical version. And later, later, uh, maybe uh, six, seven months later, the PC and console version just came out as well in digital. So this is the story summarizing more mm. of <clears throat> meta, where meta comes from, Prisoner of War. It's an MSX game. It's, um, it's, it's interesting you mentioned the PlayStation Vita community. I... I've always said, and I'll probably be, be murdered for this, I've always said that the, <laughs> play, the PlayStation Vita is one of the most underrated and underappreciated pieces of technology in modern tech. 
I genuinely believe that. Um, I agree with you. I, I agree with you. I had to port the game to PS Vita, yeah. and I had more trouble to port it to a console, like for instance <laughs> Wii U. I had to optimize rather than the Vita. The Vita itself is a, fun, it's a fantastic, uh, fantastic machine, a fantastic device. So I don't understand why it was so underrated and you know abandoned by by so no idea. It's it's a real shame. I. Mm. I love my Vita. I remember the day I got it and holding this powerhouse in my hand, thinking, how did they pack so much amazing technology into such a a small area? And the quality of the games um, were fantastic. So it it really was a missed opportunity for Sony. Um, And now I feel very sad because I don't have a copy of your physical game. (laughs) on my feet um but that's fine that's fine i can look past that um but you know it, it, again i think there are there are things in history where there are specific pieces of technology that get massively overlooked and i think the vita is probably i would say this or previous generations example of an excellent device that was made that was massively overlooked by the industry massively overlooked by the industry yeah, I think the mobile phones, you know, these big mobile phones, hurt the, the Vita a lot. But that's something that's, that's something the Vita has that any other phone will never have. The controls, the buttons, the sticks. So I don't want to play just, just you know, dragging my, my thumb on a screen. <laughs> I want press buttons. Mm. So that's something that uh, mobile phones will never have. Well, I find that quite interesting as now we are moving into a world where um you know on our mobile phones we're now having expansions added to bring those thumb controllers and the buttons in so it's it's like we're going in reverse you know we for people didn't want big bulky uh hand devices for gaming and then phones come out and people go oh great i can game on the go but then realize they haven't got the tactile feel of thumbsticks and buttons. And now we're having to buy additional devices to attach <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. To, to build the thing that was originally made. So, but it doesn't always work. Um, one, one kind of example that comes to mind is the Nokia N-Gage, but I think that failed because just the execution by Nokia wasn't correct. Um, and when you can put that up against something like the um, Nintendo Game Boy or the Game Boy Advanced, I think was at the same time when that came out, mm. the, the game quality just wasn't there. But, you know, you, you can never compare a a phone game to um, the quality of the game that you would get on a PlayStation Vita. But I... I, I, I I love the community for the Vita. I think it's one of the most um, underappreciated communities who really have a serious passion for something. And it's, it's, it's a bit like the retro community, like we said about the MSX. There are very key people who are just the beating heart of these um, iconic pieces of tech. And much like the Vita, you're still seeing lots of indie games coming out. You're seeing lots of interesting uses for the Vita. I've seen some crazy uses for it. Um, In fact, I saw one guy who completely stripped a Vita down and he integrated a Raspberry Pi inside of it. It was crazy. But it just shows with the right community, you can do something really incredible. And I think that's where the start of your development, obviously, of this game sparked from from that very very uh, community. So, one thing I wanted to ask was, when it comes to the game of of Unmetal, there's a lot of comedy that is used, and it's probably the most important part of the game for anybody who's not played it. When I was streaming it, I was nearly on the floor laughing because it's just <laughs> because honestly, it is just classic pieces of comedy over and over and over and over again and it only gets better so i have to ask do you come from a comedic background is it just something that you you think was funny to add into the game where did the comedy come in from well uh no there's no comedic in the background it's just uh me inventing the the dialogues and thinking on you know the typical cliches (laughs) <laughs> from, from movies of the 80s 
that we always love. Ah, oh, that typical big hero that maybe he's shot three times, four times. Okay, it's a scratch. Something like that. So it's it's what's what's constant in, in the movies. In fact, there's a movie from Arnold Schwarzenegger called Great uh, Great Action Hero, mm. and they talk about this. Uh, so I just I just uh, was thinking, you know, funny situations, uh, twists, uh, stories, <coughs> lines, and, and I had a lot of time. So mm. in fact, I dedicated uh, around one hour each day. Just to think, only to think, and every day you just saw a small piece of the game, or for instance, or a joke. The next day maybe I improved that, or maybe the other day, the next day I just thought how to link this part with this part, or what about the ending, or you know, lot, lot, lots of stuff. It's not something you start from the beginning and then you start thinking to the end. Mm. You just I just started with a started with a with a story and I started to change it. And change it and change it. So I prefer this part. I prefer this part. No, I need a new character. It's okay. How can I link this character to the ending? And how can I do everything? And just one hour every day thinking during for a, I mean in a year and a half, it's a lot of time. So uh, with this time, I managed to think you know uh, storylines and situations and funny things and. Uh, and that's 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 how I did it. <laughs> mm, okay. So when it came, <clears throat> excuse me, when it came to the writing of the story and mm. the comedy inside, was that completely yourself, or did you have a, a team working with you? No, it was just myself. Completely yourself. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Wow, that is very impressive. Because when you play the game, you the, well, it just shows you how good the delivery is of this game because. Mm. The quality of what you have made, in my mind, I in my mind I'm thinking this is a big studio or you know a small studio of maybe 20, 30 people. But if you've done, <laughs> but if you've done the majority of this yourself, that is really incredible. Honestly, for anyone who hasn't played Unmetal, I'm going to leave links to it below in the show notes and in the description of the video. Please go and buy it because. Whether you have played the old Metal Gears, if you're a fan of the series, even if you've heard about Metal Gear, please go and play it. The comedy alone is worth it. <laughs> without, you, que you. without question. And, you know, I've played a lot of games over the years. Um, the comedy in this is is definitely up there. Of Some of the funniest I've ever seen in gaming history. And I can say that without question. Um, well, in fact, in fact, the... the uh... The, the original text was in Spanish, why in Spanish? Ah. I translated them into English. Well, English right. Let's call it Franklish because it's not top <laughs> English. But I had a couple of guys, so Jack Lefeuille and, and, um, and, a couple, and, and someone who was helping him, working on fixing the translation into English. Right. So the, the text, just to make it more correct, more, you know, more English, and they needed a couple of months just reviewing, reviewing mm. each line and how to, how it could sound uh, natural. And something else uh, I remember is when, they, when the game was finished, I let the testers uh, play it. So I watched them when they, were, when they were playing. And something they did, I just write it down and included in the game. Right. For instance, uh, in what situation, what point the, the tester was was playing and he started to punch a track right. and he said die track and i said okay i have to insert this in the game <laughs> so now if you punch a track the character says die track yeah that's that's really good yeah i like and, that and more ideas that people say i should be it should be cool if the player if the if jesse fox could do the could do this so i did it that's that's really nice because I think a lot of game studios are probably guilty of um, releasing a game, listening to the community, and then adding updates. But it sounds like you took a very traditional way um, of making a game, which is don't release it quite to the public. Give yourself some beta testers. Take that feedback and deliver something that's perfect for what your vision is and what you want it to be. That's that's really nice to hear. Um, yeah, that's it. That's it. The more yeah. play, the more people play it, the more things you can fix, especially for difficulty or to maybe a player doesn't understand how to do this, 
and you can see it by playing it. Because as you do the game, you know it perfectly. To, so your point of view is not objective. It's very subjective. So you need someone else, especially the, the more people, the better, the better, just to find out everything. And they also will give you nice ideas. Sure. Sure, I, I I totally agree with that. So let's let's go back a few years um, to your to to young Fran as a small boy. Where did your fascina- <laughs> Where did your fascination for for gaming come from? What was your very first game that you played? Your very first PC? Do you, do you have those memories? Yes, I had my first computer, an MSX One, by the way, okay. when it was twelve. Nice. So my I, I asked my parents, I want a computer. And they said, so you prefer the computer or the motopad? And I said, the computer, of course. So when the school, at the school, when they find out they prefer a computer rather than a motopad, they all became, they told me I was some sort of geek or freak. <laughs> so what? Why would you then, not want this? The, yeah, the thing is, uh, I bought a couple of games that were very extremely expensive uh, at, at the time, mm-hmm. and they were horrible. I said, my God. So I had some sort of, uh, yeah, a book, a book about BASIC from Adult Cycler. And I said, okay, let's see what we come to here. And I learned how to program in BASIC uh, using this book. So my first game of uh, a nice game true game was one from konami called penguin adventure hmm. which is a masterpiece and later i had a couple more one is called salamander which is another masterpiece also from from konami hmm. and the maze of galleons uh, so uh, besides this uh hmm. I had other games, but uh, they were not as good as, as Konami. So Konami is some sort of like the king, mm. uh, the master doing video games for MSX because they did uh, video games. Uh, excuse me, they did video games exclusively exclusively for MSX. However, other companies they created games for Spectrum, mm. and then they ported to MSX. Right. So they were slow with just one color, or you know, uh, they didn't use the. Uh, the properties, uh, the features of MSX that make it great. Mm. So, uh, so yeah, I just I felt the passion from from the from the first moment when I touch a key and I, and I saw this letter on on a screen. I said, "This is magic! This is magic!" And just typing things and so you could program and make um, circles and figures appear on the screen. When you are twelve and you've never seen a computer before, man, that was pure magic. <laughs> and suddenly all my hobbies disappeared and was focused on computer science of programming that's that's cool that's really yeah. cool and it, it's it's very um i think i was just too young to have experienced in the uk um we had a computing drive from the government um, which birthed things like the uh, acorn the sinclair spectrum and and uh, computers of that such i always hear the same thing and i think this is where the modern generation maybe we'll never experience these types of things again you could argue maybe they are with vr but when you sat in front of a computer, as you said, and you you have no idea what you're doing, but then you start to explore and you learn and develop, and you, the things that you're inputting are being outputted onto this screen, it's one of the most magical things ever. Um, I mean, I remember as a young child just being able to load a disc and, and hearing that disc drive were, and then you suddenly see a game load in front of you and you feel like, wow, this, this is, this is powerful. You know, like a, I loaded that. That's amazing. But, you know, I feel like nowadays that, that magic is completely lost because we live in such a, an instant on world. Even things like, you know, making phone calls even 25 years ago, or maybe even 30 years ago, you know, you'd have to get in touch with somebody to then patch you through into a line and do this and do that. Now I can just pick up a phone and call someone on the other side of the world for free. It's like, wow, things <laughs> things really have changed dramatically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They um, change a lot. They change a lot. The thing is that before, back in the time, it was a discovery. So mm. it doesn't exist at all, and suddenly you discover everything. So it's a new world uh, 
opening uh, in front of your eyes. Today, you grow up from zero years old with all these world of video games and everything. So nothing is new, actually. True. Yeah. So you, you can you can get oh this game looks slightly better. Oh, but um, you already know the world. So it's like if, for instance, uh, the aliens come to Earth and they give us something completely different. You can be someone else in another world, in another mm. time. So, wow, that should be great. I can go with the Romans and myself in the Romans, and that should be good. Mm. amazing. So I can compare it to this, this experience. Yeah. It's, you know, something new, and wow, that's great. So... <laughs> What made you, I, I guess, going back to the story of migrating from the MSX game to to Unmetal, was you convinced that sticking with a Metal Gear style game was the way to go? Or were there other games that you were thinking about making besides Unmetal instead? I was thinking in, in uh, Metal Gear because uh, I really liked the look and feel. In, in, in fact, at, at the beginning, the Marcel, he's, he's the, uh, the graphic artist of the whole game. So he started doing different graphics in higher quality. I mean, in higher resolution, excuse me. Mm. But um, I didn't like uh, the result. So there's mm. something odd here. There's something I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm not convinced. There's something wrong. We have to check. We have to find out what it is. And then I asked him to reduce the uh, resolution to 320 pixels and then that was it once we reduce uh, once we reduce the uh, excuse me the quality the resolution resolution to the to the mystics one then i saw it. i saw it great so yeah that's what we need that's what we need it looks worse well, it doesn't look worse i mean more pixels but it's more vintage more retro and i really enjoy the, this I really like the, the result. So I said, okay, we have to go for it. So that, that's the reason. Mm, okay. Do you know what? It's one thing I have seen lately. Um, we can talk about ray tracing in games and the graphics and fidelity of where gaming is going. But recently I started playing a game like Unmetal that's still pixel art as, as its form, um, a game called Hunt Down. And that is very much pixelated graphics to make it look retro, but upscaled to fit our mm. modern screens. And it's one of the most beautiful games to see visually. Um, I streamed it last week and people were popping into my chat going, this looks amazing. And I was like, yeah, but it's still pixel art. Like we've, we've gone on how many generations of graphics and gaming and technology and yet the thing that we still want is <laughs> is detailed pixels on a screen that looks old as retro. And and as you said, I think that is part of the charm of Unmetal, where the graphics leads you mentally back to those old gaming memories, but the quality of the gaming that you get is modern. So it's the perfect balance of the two together. Yeah, that was the purpose. So using uh, all the type graphics, but with modern way of gaming and dialogues and, you know, uh, especially the sound. I said, mm, I don't want chipset sound. I prefer mm. modern sound, MP3, real voice. And I, I could use some, you know, uh, chip tune. But um, I like pixel art, but I don't, I don't like a lot. I, I don't like a lot of uh, chip tune. It has to be so, so, so so good but so yeah uh, for the graphics retro but for the game itself the game playing uh, the story uh, and everything so i just choose something modern one question i wanted to mm -hmm. ask was during the development what was the hardest part of making the game was it getting that balance of retro and modern or were there other technical issues that you faced during the development of the game well in general the hardest by far, the hardest part of the game, the hardest part to do in the game, I mean, in my experience for me, mm. is to choose a title. Right. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Uh, I spent months just trying to, which title should I choose for the game? Because it's very important. It's, uh, you know, it's your, your flagship, the title. Sure. And it's, it's quite hard. Uh, besides this, <clears throat> Yeah, I had lots of problems for porting the game to PlayStation 4 and Xbox. 
I have to admit it. So mm. the software for if you don't use Unity, because I'm using my own uh, my own engine, my own okay. engine programming C++. Mm. So uh, I had a very bad moment just trying to port it, uh, the game to uh, to these platforms. So you actually built your own engine specifically for the game. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Okay, I wasn't aware of that. That's very interesting to know. What that? I, how much time have you got in your hands? I'm fascinated how <laughs> how you've made how you've made this masterpiece of building an engine and doing this and doing this and doing this and doing this. And I can just about get through a day of just doing normal things. So I, I'm absolutely yeah, amazed yeah, by the, that. The thing is, uh, but uh, 15 years ago, so. There was no Unity. There was no this mm. these fantastic engines that you can use right now. So sure. if I wanted to create a game, I had to do my own my own engine. So I did it, and I've been using it over and over again with an Epic, with Goes, with a Metal, and with all the games I did before. And uh, so yes, so every time I try to improve it a little bit, just include something here, another tool here, and, and on and on. And the thing is. I had the engine already ported to, uh, to PlayStation 4 and to Xbox because I port an, an Epic and goes 1.0. But every year they change something in the in the engine, and then things you already did they stop working. They call it deprecated. Sorry, it's mm. deprecated. So what I'm supposed to do now? Okay, you have to do these other functions, and the philosophy is different. And oh my God, no! And then you have to just dig again in a big enormous engine. It's um, the help is not working because uh, the manuals are maybe deprecated too. Um, but it's it's a my God, it's a it's a nightmare. I can but I can tell my, by your voice how stressful yeah, this yeah. is. <laughs> but using my engine for me, it's it's great because I know it. I know it to the core, every detail. So I can do anything very quick, very quickly. Mm. If I want to do something, it, it normally doesn't take a lot of time because if something goes wrong i know what's what's wrong and it can fix it in a, in a matter of minutes and that's great so forgive my ignorance of not knowing too much about obviously I your forgive. engine and and unity i forgive you <laughs> Good, i'm glad you said that um in terms of taking your energy so c++ you said wasn't it yes so mm-hmm. i assume you would have to take the i guess the foundational step points of your own um, engine and incorporate that into Unity to become the same thing? Is that the correct way of approaching that? Uh, I'm not sure if I understood your question. So, so yeah, so your your engine is obviously built on certain requirements and certain specifications, mm-hmm. and I assume that you would have to take those particular parts and then embed that into Unity and build that back up. So essentially you would have almost the same thing running in sync with each other, but obviously with the quirks of what Unity has. Is, is that correct, or am I it's, slightly wrong there? The thing is, the philosophy is very different right? from Unity and I imagine C++. So uh, it's so different that uh, if I had to do something in Unity, for instance, in 3D, I, if I want to do a, a game in 3D, I can't use my engine because my engine is 2D. Sure. So I'm not going to build a 3D engine, of course. What I'm going to do is to get Unity or a real engine and use it to create something great. So I'm not going to port my uh, my engine to to Unity. It should be sure. should be crazy. It's a uh, very different philosophies. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Because as you said, I I guess it's very different to take a an engine that for most people would use it in a 3d environment Mm -hmm. whereas you're taking this engine and and using it for the complete opposite um so yeah that that must have been very stressful and and i guess you have the quirks of each individual console as well um Mm -hmm. which then adds an extra layer of complexity for you so how how do you deal with those individual console requirements well the thing um, most of the engine and the whole game they're common code so they work everywhere. And I have a few separate files that uh, uh, attacks directly the, the console. Because right. basically, whatever you do in the game is common everywhere. But the how to, for instance, uh, to upload the texture or upload a triangle or get the input from, from the keys, 
um, something else, just get the input, uh, draw something on the screen, um, play a sound, play a sound effects, and maybe get the timing, the timers, and just a few more you know, stuff. This is the only difference between one console and one PC and another console. So right, okay. by changing the code of a few of a few files, by adapting each file to each console, then boom, I've got the game directly working in the in the in the console. I don't have to record the game entirely again. Yeah, Just maybe, right. for instance, uh, as an example, so Xbox requires that you have to get a new option for to change the user in the main menu. Mm-hmm. Okay, so if in the game I have to include an extra line. If we are in Xbox, then include this include this option to change the user. Something that Xbox should to do should have to do by themselves. Right. Not as the the coders. Right. I see. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say so, that would be quite quite a challenge to try and do that. So yeah, that, that should be something transparent to the user. But now we have to deal with it. But basically, it's just this. It's just this. Just adapting a few. A few uh, a few files that attacks directly the the platform and that's it and that looks very easy yes it looks <laughs> simple but it's not it's not because <laughs> these files are depends on the big engine from the console and uh, you know each console each console has their own their own philosophy and how to work and. Oh uh, my God, it's an ember. <laughs> <laughs> I, as I said, I can I can hear in your voice the, uh, the 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 frustration of what you must have gone through. But we can yeah. definitely say that it was worth it. One hundred percent, it was worth the the, the stress and strain. Mm-hmm. As I said, for anyone who's listening or watching this, please make sure you go and try the game. It's in my opinion, it's one of my favorite games of all time because it's just a combination of everything I love in retro and everything I love in modern gaming with a whole ton of comedy poured on top, which is just, it's a work of art. It really is. Um, so coming into some other parts, you said obviously the majority of what you did was yourself, um, but you did have some assistance with certain people along the way. Mm-hmm. How did you get this assistance? Is it people that you knew? Did you advertise, hey, I'm making this game, can someone help? What, what was your process of finding additional people to help you with the project? Well, thanks to, to previous projects like an Epic and Gold 1.0, now I, uh, I know several people that can help me. For instance, uh, translators. I have translators mm. that translate the game into different uh, languages because they love my just because they love my work, and they also just play the game. I have a few friends that also they act they act as a tester. You know, they play the game and they give me my other opinion. In yeah. fact, I want I've got a friend who's called Michael. Michael, he's he's very he's he's not for kidding. Right. So he's very merciless when he when he plays the game. He says, "Friend, no, 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 friend, this can be no, no. We are the deep, deep shit, friend. You can't do that. The player is going to be angry. And this, no, no, my God, my God, you have lot, lot of stuff to fix here, friend. I said, okay, I'm going to get depressed. <laughs> but, but thanks to to these people, I know uh, I can improve the game, make it better, mm. and especially remove remove all these parts that may be." frustrating frustrating hmm. yeah that's it's it's an area of gaming that is always overlooked in my day job i work in digital marketing and i understand fully that working with digi- different markets different languages different regions mm-hmm. um as you said you took your your script in spanish and localized this for english and with my little knowledge of spanish the way that you construct sentences is completely Mm -hmm. different in some cases of how you would do that in english so the way that a a comedy line could be delivered in spanish if you did a literal translation would probably would not mean anything so it's nice that you've taken that time to um localize those parts because as a user myself um it really does. It does have an impact on the the user with the reaction of what comes with the the dialogue and and everything in the game. Mm. So, <laughs> coming on to the the other parts, was the game ever uh, audible in different languages? Was it only did you only do the voiceovers in English, or were they done in other languages as well? Uh, in my games, I voice the game into English and Spanish. Oh, okay. 
in Spanish, it's always in Spanish because I have a large community here in Spain. Everyone mm. knows me. <laughs> and I think they love me because, because I give them what they want. You know, so normally games are voiced in English and triple R games are translated into Spanish and voiced in Spanish. But it's something done by a company somewhere else and they don't care. They just want it in Spanish. But I, uh, I control myself the the voicing in English and in Spanish, right? And then so people love the way the the game is voiced into Spanish, and they say, "Man, that sounds better than a triple R game." Not <laughs> sounds better, but I mean the voice, uh, you know the uh, how do you call it in English? The, I don't know the delivery. Um, how it's how it's been said. How you delivery. act. How you yeah. act. The, yeah. How you act when, when speaking. Mm. And uh, they're very happy for us. Recently, and now, for instance, um, and metal is now being translated into German, not translated, excuse me, voiced in, into German. Oh, wow. So, yeah, there was a, a guy that said, hey, I would like to try. I have a team of actors and we could do this. And they worked on it because, okay, if you want, if you want to do it, try it. And they worked on it. And hmm. Ghost 1.0 was voiced into Russian as well. Because Russia was the second country with more cells. And I said, wow. I want to thank them by just offering a voice in, in Russian. And, uh, and so, but, but basically, it's just uh, English and, and Spanish. And Spanish. Okay. So here's a, here's a question for you. If somebody came up to you and said, Fran, I want to localize this in insert language, mm-hmm. would you be willing to do it? So let, yeah, let's, of course. Let's but let's be adventurous and say Arabic. Would you would you translate it into Arabic? We're doing it now. No way. Yeah, 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 yeah. <gasps> so it turns out that one of my um, biggest fans for MSX, he told me, "Hey, Fran, I want to translate Unmetal into Arabic." Right. And he started a week ago, and yesterday I was working into inserting the symbols of Arabic in yep. in the game. Mm-hmm. But it's a it's a it's a big 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 mess because depending on where is the symbol, the image change. Yeah, that's correct. So oh my god, oh my god, <laughs> it's a bit... so basically I am now the translate. Well, we are we're translating the the game into into Arabic, and I'm right. working on it. That's um, amazing. That <laughs> yes. is amazing because because uh, I mean I wouldn't say I'm a, a native Arabic speaker, but I've got some understanding of the language, and I've got probably enough understanding to get by but the fact that you've actually taken that on board and as you said the the arabic language is a very unique um build up of characters where depending on how the letters are constructed will change the shape and that's how, correct. how it that's looks correct. so that that obviously causes you a problem if you've got a frame this big where you need text to go in it and it's changing all the time your requirements are, are changing as that that wording changes as well that's amazing to hear i'm so happy to hear that that that's going to be fantastic is there a, a timeline on when that's going to be finished i'm just i don't i'm know. just interested no no that's that's, that's not timeline because it's something we just do when it's finished it's finished it's finished the, got the you. part of being uh, an indie developer is that no one is pressing you so you do things as they go you're in a rush it's finished okay let's publish it and this is this is a this is quite this is a big thing because when you do things without stress and you do things right, then the result the result normally is, is bad is bad. Totally, totally, totally agree. I think yeah. when you mm-hmm. when you give yourself an aggressive deadline, it can cause um, loss of creativity. I think it adds additional stress to the development time, and I think you become so obsessed with the date and time that you forget all of the other important things um and you know i've said it before i'll say it again it just shows when you take your methodology of how to make a game without i guess restrictions for yourself and without a a hard deadline you really can produce an absolute masterpiece and this comes back to some other things in gaming where people get very disheartened when a studio says look you know we said this date we're going to have to push it six months, eight months, or whatever. I would rather wait six months, eight months for a much better quality game mm-hmm. than something that gets released half-baked. And I think the biggest example of that is probably Cyberpunk. 
um, where this big media hype and the drum and it's completely revolutionary. And then it came out and everyone went, Oh, (laughs) maybe, maybe it isn't what we thought. And I, I genuinely feel maybe by the end of this year, cyberpunk will be the game that it could have been if people had just let the developers get on with it without constantly beating the drum behind them. Um, because I, I, I get it, CD Projekt Red needed to, to get the game out there. They've got shareholders, they've got people who've invested money into the game, and they needed to deliver. And unfortunately, I think it was a choice of, well, do we try and reclaim some of the money back and fix it as we go, or do we keep delaying it and annoying people with the risk of people pulling their resources out? So I feel like there was a gun to their head, but I, I, I honestly believe if people had given them more time, the game could have been a real masterpiece like yours. Um, although, <laughs> although, you. although comparing yours to cyberpunk is, uh, is quite funny, but, um, but yeah, it's, it, 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 as I said, and as yeah. you said, deadlines, I think, deadlines are not good. No, especially I, I, I because agree. imagine you have the, the game ready or almost ready and you have two months. So what do you do? Do you just wait? You, mm. You're never going to wait. You, you, uh, so the philosophy is, I have two months. We can add something else in the game. Mm. So you add it. And then you add it and add it. And you say, oh, there's a week left. Okay, we still can introduce that, uh, this new idea. So you just try to get the maximum time just to insert in the game what you can to do it better. And, you know, and then the deadlines come. And, oops, maybe I, I won't arrive in time. <laughs> Yeah. Because by adding things, you get new issues, new bugs. Yeah, That's I totally happened. agree. So it happens. So I'm going to do this new, but by doing this, oh my God. But uh, So uh, in the end, <laughs> in the end <laughs> yeah. you try to, to do what you can uh, till the last minute. Don't give um, yourself deadlines. There's there's the yeah. title of the podcast. <laughs> People are like, what? Um, so coming into kind of your, your modern day now, is there, and I guess I don't know if you're going to say yes or no, but is there an Unmetal 2 on the way or any further developments off the back of that? Right now, uh, there's nothing on the way. So okay. I finished an MSX game, MSX2 game called okay. uh, Pampas and Celine. That is about, it's about to be finished. And uh, right after I finish it, I'm going to do a porting to a normal porting, not a big one, <laughs> to PC and Switch. Okay. And after this, I have to I have to decide what to do. Ooh. And there's three ideas on the table. So the first one is an Epic 2. There's a lot of people that have been asking for this for, for years and years. The second idea is on Metal 2. And the third idea is something completely new, a brand new right. IP, brand new idea, because I have something on my, on my head. So right now, I have a lot of ideas for everything. I have ideas right. for Metal 2. I have ideas for an Epic 2 and ideas for other games. But the, the, the part with most fresh ideas and more content is a Metal 2. Mm-hmm. I mean, I have a lot, lot of um, situations and a lot of uh, a storyline. And I've been thinking. <laughs> so yes, I have everything here inside. And I, I really would like to, to create a Metal 2. Mm. The thing is, my heart says a Metal 2 or a new project. My brain says an Epic sold much, much, much better than a Metal 2. So you should do an Epic 2. <laughs> and this is going to be a fight between, uh, excuse me, between, uh, against, um, yeah, between the brain and the heart. Yeah. So, who's going to win? <laughs> the, hard, <laughs> who's gonna win? <laughs> the hardest battle of all. Well, for me, it would definitely be on Metal 2. I, I, I have digested that game more than probably anyone else, and I just I love it so much. Um, and I would love to see a second version. But you know, I think you have to do what is best for you. Um, mm-hmm. I know the community will throw everything at you but at the end of the day you're you're the decision maker you have to do what yeah. was right for you right but again you know you have such a fantastic community um i mean you only have to go and have a look at the reviews of unmetal on steam or anywhere to be honest just mm-hmm. to see the the level of passion the joy that the game was given people which is just amazing i have to ask you this though 
when you ported Unmetal to the PC and the Switch and, and the consoles, mm-hmm. did you think it was going to be as successful as it is? I thought it would, um, in terms of in terms of sales, excuse me, in terms of sales, I thought it, it was going to be three times more successful. Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, concerning the the opinion of people, uh, I was I was ninety uh, percent sure it was it was going to be what it was. Right. Because. Other people that saw the game and played the game, they said it was fantastic, they loved it. And I said, okay, if everyone is liking the game, so the rest of the community will, will do as well. And, and it was. So the reception has been magnificent, absolutely stunning. So and the test, the proof of it is by finishing the game. So if you finish the game, if you play the whole game from the start to the end, and then you publish it, hey, uh, screenshots of the end, I finished this game, and I loved it. So finishing a, finishing a, uh, excuse me, finishing a game is one of the best gifts you can do to a developer. Because yeah. that means that you enjoy the game from the beginning and to the end, and you spend your time playing this game instead of the thousands of other games and triple <laughs> A games and whatever. And this for us means a lot. Hmm, and seeing right. Twitter with a lot of people just uh, publishing um, screenshots of the end of the game, that was fantastic. And everyone just just talking uh, incredibly about, about the game. We loved it. We loved the humor, especially the humor, because humor is something very subjective. It's... So a game can have great graphics and everyone will think they have great graphics or great music, but humor is very, very, very subjective. I agree. Some people love Jim Curry, other people detest Jim Curry. So so I thought maybe the humor is going to fail here because some cultures uh, depend on... But in the end, uh, it looks like it works very well. I, I totally agree, and I think that's that's one of the beautiful parts of the game is that, as you said, there can be uh, local comedy um, or dialogue that would be said maybe in England versus America, where if I said it in America, they wouldn't get it, but if I said it in England, they would. But I think the foundational level of comedy that runs through the game it doesn't matter who you are. You understand it and you get it straight away. Um, I mean, even from the beginning, uh, spoilers, um, the <laughs> the rope um, and then that constant discussion during that interview period where he's like, well, how did you get out? And he's like, I'll tell you later. Like that whole thing mm-hmm. of leaving that in the user's mind or the <laughs> game player's mind all the way through is just fantastic because – even when I was streaming it, my chat were like talking about, okay, so how would he have done it? And they're literally like streams of streams of like, oh, well, I think he must have done this and may have done that and this and that and this and that. So it's just, it really is fantastic. And I, I think, the as role. I said, it's, it's, it's very hard to describe the game to people. I, I, the only thing I can say is just go and play it. Um, whether you're a fan of Metal Gear or not, I I think if you if you enjoy a game that's enjoyable and you like to have fun, and I think that's the important part, it's a fun game to play as well. Um, please go and play, and there will be links to to, to everywhere. Um, the inclusion of combining um, different items in the game was that inspired from somewhere? Was that like yes. a Resident Evil type thing? Oh, okay, yes, it was inspired from. So I, I said I don't like mobile mobile games, but this is one. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I like this one game I uh, enjoyed, but just a little bit. It's called Alchemy, where okay. you have fire, water, fire, water, air, and earth. So you can combine them, and then you right. start to, to create more and more and more stuff. I love oh. the idea of combining two elements to create a new one. And I said mm. I have to include this in, in, in a metal. It's not going to be key in the game, but some. I have to include some, so that the, the player can experience with it, and maybe they can get the combinations. And, and yeah, that's that's the reason. This is my inspiration. The, the game called Alchemy. Alchemy. Okay. All right. I might have to check that out. That sounds really interesting. I. I... <laughs> I must admit, I did blow myself up quite a few times on purpose, uh, <laughs> mixing mixing the wrong items. And uh, yeah, I, I laughed quite a lot about that. Um, it was very embarrassing. Um, 
This is an interesting question. Through all the screenshots and the tweets and the messages that you've got, are there any hidden Easter eggs that no one's found in the game yet? Uh, there's an Easter egg that oh. I that I haven't seen it on, on the internet yet. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Well, there you, there you go, world. We need to go and hunt that Easter egg now and uh, and show Fran that someone has got it. <laughs> Unless they yeah, have, yeah, yeah. and they've not told anyone. <laughs> In fact, each chapter has a number of secrets on it. And at the end of the chapter, it tells you how many secrets did you find. Mm. So if you manage to find if you manage to find all secrets, you will find all the Easter eggs. That's one at ah. the end of its level chapter nine. Chapter nine, it's uh, quite an Easter egg from another game. Okay, interesting. You've you've left left us on a cliffhanger there. I'm gonna, damn it! Now I'm going to have to go back and replay it. Not that I'm going to complain. So um, yeah, well, I think we're pretty much near enough at the end of the time there. So uh, that has flown by. That has really, really flown by. Of oh, it's been an hour already. I know. Great, crazy, isn't it? It's amazing how yeah. quickly time can go. Yeah, um, so once flies when you enjoy. Exactly. So please, once again, um, talk about anything you've got, your social medias, you know, the floor is yours again to promote anything that you want. Uh, what can and I tell and, you? And, and go and buy Unmetal. <laughs> <laughs> now. Yeah, go so play Unmetal. There's a free demo on Steam in case you are still thinking of... Don't think, buy it. Buy it now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I hope you like it. I hope you enjoy it. And... Uh, um, nothing else to say. I'm looking wow. forward to starting a new a new project, again, but unfortunately, can't tell you yet what's going to be. If you if sales of uh, of and metal just continue to go uh, oh, to go to go to go mm. on, excuse me. So I will think on doing and metal too. I have a lot of fresh ideas and. I've, I've got the fresh code in my mind still. Hmm. So, yeah, yeah. I really fancy. I really want to do it. But uh, it all depends on the sales and how everything just progress and goes. Thank you very much for uh, for listening to me. No, <laughs> no, I, no, apologize, I apologize for my, for my Franklish. <laughs> <laughs> no, please, please don't apologize for your 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 language. Your language is perfect, and I I've understood you, and I'm sure mm. everybody else. So so never apologize for learning a new language, which is something that a lot of people can't do. So you should be very proud that not only do you know C plus plus, but you know English and Spanish. So uh, <laughs> that's something to be proud of for sure. And you've made an absolute masterpiece in this game. In fact, I think I may actually go and play it after we uh, finish up here. Um, but honestly, Fran, it's been a, a brilliant brilliant piece to talk to you i'm so happy to be able to speak to you and it's not very often i get to speak to developers of games i've had some people that i know i've had crazy people from you know industries i've spoken to people who have made mortal Kombat to anyone else but you without question have been my favorite guest of all time you've been an inspiration and made one of my favorite games of all time so from me to you a huge thank you for everything that you've done and i'm sure i'm absolutely positive that whatever you put your hands to next is going to be an absolute masterpiece to come as well okay thank you very much by the way uh you sent me a DM on October, remember? I did. And it was made maybe a week ago, no, a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is true. I did. I miss, yeah, I miss your, I miss your DM. And by reading, I, by reading it, I, excuse me, by reading it, I'm now here with you. Exactly. Here. It's true. So it just shows uh, if you do slide into someone's DMs, you never know when they're going to respond. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. so there, there's, there's your exactly. takeaway comment. But honestly, Fran, it's been fantastic. Um, and as I said, all of your social media links and everything will be placed into the show notes. Um, and I guess if you do want to localize the game for your particular market to, to drop you a DM on Twitter, is that the best place to contact you on? Mm -hmm. Yes, always Twitter. Okay, perfect. Well, well, there you go. So there we go. I will end the show. And there we go. That was Fran from the game Unmetal. I've been Me Machine Dean. Have a wonderful day or evening wherever you are in the world. And from me, Me Machine Dean, Fran, take care. Good See time. you later, everyone. Take care. Hi there, Dean here. Hope you enjoyed that episode. Make sure you add this podcast to your favorites on whichever podcasting platform you use and give it a positive review. Until next time, me Machine Dean, signing out.